So, uh, welcome everyone tonight. I, it's really my my pleasure to um, introduce to you our guest tonight. He's a friend of mine. We were at the University of Chicago at the same time in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, and he did he did much better than I did, and got out of there a lot more quickly. By the time I finished I finished my PhD, he had already finished another degree, uh, JD in law. So he's extremely precocious. Uh, Mohammed Faldel is currently uh, an associate professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto. He's been there since 2006. He received his PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from the University of Chicago and his JD from the University of Virginia. Well, at the University of Virginia School of Law, he was the John M. Olin Law and Economics Scholar and Articles Development editor of the Virginia Law Review. Um, he was admitted to the Bar of New York in 2000 and practiced law with the firm of Sullivan and Cromwell in New York City, where he worked on a wide variety of corporate finance transactions and security-related regulatory investigations. In addition, he served as law clerk uh, to Paul Niemeyer of the uh, United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit and many other things. Now, the reason why we're inviting him here is because he uh, has um, is a very important scholar of Islamic law and legal theory. He wrote a wonderful PhD dissertation on uh, witnessing in the Maliki School of Law. He currently is teaching uh, my uh, course on Introduction to Islamic Law, and the students have read a number of his articles, including one this week. Um, Muhammad has written on uh, on liberalism and Islamic law. He's written about uh, politics. He's done a lot of work recently on um, uh, the Arab Spring and what um, issues like uh, democracy, corruption, inclusion of women in the political process, what uh, possibilities there are for all of these different issues. Um, my favorite article of his, which I have assigned to students before, is his article, an oldie but a goodie, all the way back to 1997, Two Women, One Man, Knowledge, Power, and Gender in Medieval Sunni Legal Thought. Uh, my students for this week had to read The Truth, The Good, and The Reasonable, The Theological and Ethical Roots of Public Reason in Islamic Law. So I know that there are going to be many questions, many informed questions at the end of this talk. Um, and today, uh, Professor Faldo is speaking about Islam and liberalism, so we look forward to that. Thank you, Ingrid, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's always great to see Ingrid, and uh, it's always, uh, I've never been here before, but I'm tremendously honored to come here given the history uh, of this uh, seminary and including Islamic studies in North America. And it's just wonderful seeing how it's grown and developed and seeing all you here, all you students here, uh, studying with such great scholars of Islam. And so um, tonight, I think I'm not going to be talking about, uh, I'm not going to be revisiting some of the things that I've already written, and I guess that you guys have probably read pertaining to the substance of Islamic law or theology so much as I want to talk about how uh, liberalism, viewed as a kind of political moral philosophy, uh, should be encountering Islam and how Muslims as liberal citizens should be relating to liberalism. And I think this is a very important question, of course. I mean, we are here in the United States, and it's certainly not a shock or shouldn't be a surprise to you if I say that there is a, an epidemic, for lack of a better term, of Islamophobia in the United States, uh, which I think, and I will argue, is causing a serious crisis in not just the rights of American Muslim citizens, but also, I think, is uh, a catalyst for the general decay of our common political culture and should be something that concerns all Americans, Muslim or non-Muslim. So, 
Um, the late Samuel Huntington, a professor of international relations at Harvard University, famously predicted that in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, international relations would revert to a quote-unquote conflict of civilizations model along the lines that existed prior to the 20th century. One of the conflicts that Huntington was particularly concerned with resurface was the ancient conflict between the Western world, Latin Christendom, and the Islamic world. The ink on the page of his manuscript has scarcely dried when, as if on cue, Osama bin Laden and his ragtag army of followers, otherwise known as Al Qaeda, declared war on the United States and its allies. While not taken seriously immediately, Al Qaeda proved itself to be a determined foe, successfully attacking the USS Cole in Yemen and launching a devastating attack against US embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. Then, of course, came the atrocity of 9 11, in which 19 members of Al Qaeda successfully hijacked four civilian airliners and crashed three of them into the World Trade Center towers in Manhattan and one in, in the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia. Nearly 3,000 people died, the vast majority of whom were Air Americans, although numerous nationals from other countries died as well. As is well known, the United States, under the leadership of then President Bush, launched a response what he called, quote unquote, a global war on terrorism. And while Mr. Bush repeatedly uh, emphasized that the United States was not a war with Islam, but only a small group of violent and ruthless fanatics, the sweeping rhetoric that the president used and his administration's global ambitions to, quote unquote, transform the Muslim world, perhaps best exemplified in the reckless and disastrous decision to invade Iraq, gave a signal to many Americans that perhaps the threat was not limited to Al-Qaeda, but rather included broad sections, broad cross-sections of the Muslim world. The threat posed by Al-Qaeda also seemed to be per per pervasive when, contrary to all predictions of the administration, the invasion of Iraq did not result in Americans being welcomed as liberators, but instead a bloody anti-US insurgency broke out in addition to a bloody and bitter sectarian civil war. The sheer scale of violence in Iraq, combined with the reconstitution of the Taliban in Afghanistan uh, after its initial defeat in the winter of 2001, contributed to reinforce an exaggerated sense of the pervasive threat that Muslims seem to pose to Americans. Meanwhile, a similar dynamic was taking place in Western European democracies, such as Great Britain, Germany, and France. And the roots of that anxiety had even predated 9-11 when these societies have already come to be suspicious of the increasing number of Muslims living in their midst. The attacks of 9-11 and then the London and Madrid subway attacks only reinforced the generalized and diffuse sense that Muslims threaten the public order. Even before 9-11, then, even before 9-11, the declaration of global war on terror and the invasion of Iraq, leading Western democracies had already begun to exhibit heightened anxiety about, about the increasing numbers of Muslims living among them. The events of 9 11 and the US reaction thereto only deepened these anxieties and gave immediate relevance to what had previously been relatively marginal voices calling for enhanced scrutiny and policing of Muslim communities in the West. One can say that, in the light of the policies adopted almost universally among Western democracies post 9 11, that those voices went from being marginal to central because of. The, because they've gone, because they are now essentially crafting the legal policy of Western democracies toward their Muslim populations. The most important outcome of this post 9 11 shift in policy toward Muslims was the adoption of a proactive strategy intended to interdict terrorism, not to investigate it after it occurred. This created somewhat of a conundrum from the perspective of law enforcement, who, in the ordinary case, is not entitled to intervene until it has, at a minimum, a reasonable suspicion that the suspect is committing a crime. To circumvent this problem, law enforcement began aggressive electronic and physical monitoring of the American Muslim community and launched numerous quote unquote sting operations of dubious value. And government prosecutors adopted extremely broad interpretations of criminal statutes such as, such as conspiracy material support for terrorism that would allow them to bring criminal prosecutions against individuals even though they were not involved in, nor even directly planning, acts of violence. The expansion of the criminal law in the service of the domestic legal war on terrorism perhaps reaches apogee in a recent Supreme Court decision known as Humanitarian Law Project v. Holder, 
in which the Supreme Court of the United States held in a 6-3 decision that providing training on international humanitarian law to a designated foreign terrorist group, even for the purpose of convincing that terrorist group to adhere to international humanitarian law, would constitute, quote-unquote, material support under the relevant federal statute, and that criminalization of such activities did not violate the First Amendment's guarantee of free speech, at least in circumstances where such free speech was coordinated with the foreign terrorist organization. Now, one might reasonably ask, how can one train them in the laws of humanitarian law unless you coordinate with them? So it's kind of not quite clear uh, how significant the coordination requirement actually is. Europe, too, has taken dramatic, dramatic steps to increase surveillance, regulation, and even exclusion of Muslims entirely from the European project. To mention some of the more prominent actions taken in the defense of Europe from Islam, the French famously passed bans on the headscarf in schools and criminalized the face veil, while at the same time making it virtually impossible for a woman wearing the headscarf to participate in any, act, any capacity in the formal employment sector, except perhaps in a janitorial life. The Swiss have banned minarets, and various European jurisdictions, for example, the Netherlands, have subjected prospective immigrants to tests that are the modern equivalents of inquisitions, in which the goal is not to uh, discover certain kinds of criminal conduct, but rather to ascertain the private opinions of Muslim immigrants regarding controversial social practices, such as public homosexual kissing and public nudity. Indeed, the European Court of Human Rights itself, in two post-9-11 cases, has effectively given European states a free hand in regulating the practice of, the practice of Islam on their territories, even using language suggesting that the peaceful propagation of Islam could be legitimately prescribed by national authorities should they choose to do so. The aggregate result of these policies has been a profound contraction in the effective sphere of the rights of Muslim citizens in Western democracies. This is not simply an effect of government policies. Um, the negative effects of government policies on Muslim rights are further amplified because of how they interact with public opinion. When the general public sees the government targeting Muslims for surveillance and Muslim practices for specific regulation, it reinforces pre-existing fears and suspicions of Muslims. It is no exaggeration to suggest that official government policies adopted in the wake of 9-11 are themselves at least partially responsible for the virulent anti-Muslim political movements that have come to the forefront of politics in the Europe and Europe and the United States. Now, if one is inclined to defend these policies, one might point out to the point out the concept of quote unquote militant democracy. This was a term coined by Karl Lowenstein in, the, in 1937 in response to the inability of democracies during the interwar period from resisting takeover by fascists uh, by preemptively restricting uh, uh, the rights of those who would bring down the democratic order. According to the theory of militant democracy, a democracy is entitled to act preemptively against groups who would use their rights to undermine the stability of the democratic order, and perhaps even replace it entirely with an authoritarian or even totalitarian political system. Indeed, even John Rawls, uh, the most important liberal American liberal philosopher in the post-world era signals his principle, to, his, his agreement in principle with the basic idea of militant democracy, a concept to which he refers without mentioning its name in the seminal work Theory of Justice. There, he argues that in certain circumstances, it is permissible for a liberal state to suppress an intolerant sect or political faction. However, it's useful in this context to quote Rawls's view in some detail on this issue. He writes that, in general, liberty of conscience may be limited, quote unquote, quote, only where there is a reasonable expectation that not doing so will damage the public order which the government should maintain. This expectation must be based on evidence and ways of reasoning acceptable to all. It must be supported by ordinary observation and modes of thought, including the modes of rational scientific inquiry where these are not controversial, where, which are generally recognized as correct. So basically what Rawls is saying, right, is that uh, militant democracy, the idea of acting preemptively to restrict certain groups' rights, is a uh, legitimate concept within a liberal democracy, but subject to conditions. One, the political order itself has to be just, right? Uh, that means 
acting to defend a political order which is worth defending, first of all. Second of all, the expectation or the fear of a takeover by an intolerant sect must be reasonable based on evidence that's objective, right? So that's what he means by supported by ordinary observation and modes of thought, right? Not based on speculation, not based on um, uh, interpretations that are not obvious. And while the intolerant, according to Rawls, are not entitled to complain of their oppression in the hand of others, because after all, by, by hypothesis, they're willing to oppress others and give them power, so not morally entitled to complain. Uh, the tolerant, however, do have standing to complain of the violation of the principles of justice, uh, which permits suppression of intolerant views only, quote, when the tolerant sincerely and with reason believe that intolerance is necessary for their own security. So according to Rawls, the simple existence of the intolerant sect is insufficient to justify its suppression. Quote, there must be some considerable risks to our own legitimate interests. Thus, just citizens should strive to preserve the Constitution with all its equal liberties, as long as liberty itself and their own freedom are not in danger. This includes forcing the tolerant to respect the liberty of others. Quote, but when the Constitution itself is secure, there is no reason to deny freedom to the intolerant. And so Rawls recognizes this idea of relative democracy, but he restricts it very narrowly. Right? And he goes on and says, if an intolerant sect appears in a well-ordered society, the others should keep in mind the inherent stability of their institutions. The liberties of the intolerant may persuade them to a belief in freedom. This persuasion works on the psychological principle that those whose liberties are protected by and who benefit from a just constitution will, other things equal, acquire an allegiance to it over a period of time. So even if an intolerant sect should arise, provided that it is not so strong initially that it can impose its will straight away, or does not grow so rapidly that the psychological principle has no time to take hold, it will tend to lose its intolerance and accept liberty of conscience. So while the notion that a liberal regime may, in certain circumstances, limit the rights of the intolerant to protect itself is not a controversial theoretical proposition, the devil, so to speak, is in the details. In other words, what is not controversial is the theoretical proposition that a just regime dedicated to the principle of equal liberty has the right to intervene to suppress a group that would subvert its justice. The controversy is empirical. How does one know that a targeted group is indeed committed to destroying a regime of equal liberty? And when does one know that it generally represents a threat to a regime of equal liberty? The paradigmatic case for the application of the principle of militant democracy, of course, is Nazi Germany, where the Nazi party under the leadership of Adolf Hitler was able to assume power, at least initially, through constitutionally valid procedures. Does the, does the Nazi analogy, however, hold up in the case of the Muslim community? context of the war on terrorism in the United States, in Canada, or any other Western liberal democracy. I don't, I don't want to go into all the details as to why I think it's wildly implausible to believe that the Muslim communities in various Western democracies come close to satisfying or being the equivalent of the situation of the Nazi party in Weimar Germany. Right. Um, so even if we were to assume that Muslims were guilty of harboring all the anti-democratic positions attributed to them by the most extreme anti-Muslim groups in the United States, such as those who published the screed Sharia, the threat to America, Muslims simply are not in a position to threaten the stability of the US democratic order, nor the stability of any democratic order in the West for that matter. The Muslim community is neither threateningly large nor is it growing at such a rate that, in the words of Rawls, quote, the psychological principle, unquote, of tolerance has no time to take hold. So this is a very important point, right? That unless one believes that the just institutions of a democracy, right, are not capable of, so to speak, converting people to tolerance, right, then whatever the content of Islamic beliefs are, right, uh, should, we should be a matter of indifferent to us. So really this is a question, those who raise this question, 
of the relationship of the content of Islamic beliefs to democracy and, and argue that there is some kind of long-term threat to the stability of democracy arising out of Islam are really uh, admitting to a lack of faith in democratic institutions, right? regardless of what the content of actual Muslim beliefs are. Now, one might agree with me that Muslims do not pose a threat to the democratic order as such, but nevertheless argue that enhanced surveillance of this community is justified under the same logic as that of militant democracy, namely, on the grounds that this community presents a particular threat to public safety that justifies a broad, preemptive approach. Again, the question here is largely empirical. One can hardly quibble with the idea that a just society has the right to defend itself against an internal group that reasonably threatens its peace, that is reasonably perceived to be threatening its peace. But can that characterization reasonably be applied to Muslims living in the United States or Western Europe? To answer this question, one must turn to some objective statistical analysis in order to overcome what behavioral psychologists call the availability heuristic. The availability heuristic is one of many rules of thumb techniques of common sense reasoning common to human beings that allows them to simplify reality and make quick judgments. Unfortunately, while such cognitive tools may have been necessary for human survival, when our ancestors were hunter-gatherers living out the savannah, on continual alert for potential en enemies that could destroy us in an instant, in the complex realities of the 21st century, the availability heuristic just as often operates as a pernicious bias that distorts the way we see the world in accordance with our most recent experience, which may not be at all consistent with the relevant statistical base rate of the phenomenon on an issue. The availability heuristic works by making us believe that, we re that what we remember as a salient experience is in fact what we ought to rank as our most important concerns. Right? In other words, when I say terrorism and 9-11 comes to your mind, because 9-11 comes to your mind, you sort of naturally infer that what you need to worry about is al qaeda That's the availability of your student, because that's the mental image that's available to you in your mind, right? Because it was so, um, it was, it's, it's recent, palpable, and the impact was so large. However, there is no logical relationship between the vividness of your memory and the actual risk of that occurrence taking place, right? That's why it can lead to a cognitive bias in the language of behavioral uh, psychologists, right? So 9-11 is an ex excellent example of how the availability heuristic operates to skew our perception of risk. Now, it's hard to think of a higher impact event. You killed almost 3,000 people and four civilian airliners were hijacked in a, in a single day. Nor, nor is it possible to think of one with higher coverage. It's fair to say that very few Americans who are old enough to have any memories on September 11, 2001, do not have a distinctive memory of that day. In fact, we lived in Manhattan. We lived two blocks from the World Trade Center. My daughter, my second daughter, I think was four years old at the time. It was her first day going to preschool. She remembers, right? Anyway, so um, I think everybody <coughs> who was around then and who has any memory of anything is going to have a very vivid recollection of, of, of that event. Yet the vividness of this memory and of its devastating impact tells us nothing about the likelihood of it happening again. Surely the incompetence of U.S. airport security has as much to do with the success of Al-Qaeda on 9-11 as did the determination of the terrorists. Presumably, the enhanced security measures adopted since 9-11 in airports have effectively prevented the recurrence of at least that scenario. But the United States and other democratic countries have adopted enhanced security measures across the board. And the United States in particular has provided so much increased anti-terrorism funding that even the smallest and most out-of-the-way communities have been given resources to prevent terrorism. Inevitably, that means more and more of a focus on Muslims and the Muslim community. But are these increased expenditures on security, almost all of which end up focused on the Muslim community, reasonably related to an objective rather than biased measure of the actual risk? I think a fair-minded person would have to conclude that the answer is a clear no. But to do this, we must begin by arriving at an objective estimate of the base rate of terrorism relative to the base rate of other kinds of risks that we face every day. Now, we don't know what the base rate of terrorism actually is. 
So we have to do this exercise by proposing various hypothetical base rates in order to illustrate the problem of what I'm calling relative risk. According to one study, if we were to assume that terrorists completely destroyed one of the United States' 40,000 shopping malls every week, right, for a whole year, the chances of an individual American dying under that scenario would be one in a million or more. Assuming the terrorists hijacked and blew up one of the 18,000 weekly U.S. commercial airline flights, an individual's chance of dying in that flight would be one in 135,000 in a year. And if terrorists successfully pulled off an attack of the magnitude of 9-11 once a year, an individual American's one-year risk of dying in such an attack would be one in 100,000. And his lifetime risk would be 1 in 1,300. Now compare these risks, which are based on an inflated sense of the success of terrorism, right, with the kinds of ordinary risks that we face every day and are very, very real. Right? The risks from dying and drowning, these are all on a, on a lifetime basis. Okay? Lifetime risk of dying from drowning, 1 in 1,100. Risk from dying in a car crash, 1 in 83 lifetime risk, pretty high. Take the plane. Dying from an airplane crash, 1 in 5,000 on a lifetime. Dying from walking across the, tree, the street, not adjusted for class differences, unfortunately, 1 in 625. Pretty high when you think about it. And being murdered, shocking, 1 in 210. 1 in 210 Americans will die from murder. Right? So the odds of you being murdered are much, much, much higher than the odds of you dying in a terrorist attack, even assuming that we have a 9-11 once a year. Right. Um, second, we want to ask whether the increased spending on security against terrorism is reasonably related to the actual base rate of terrorism. Again, we have to, we don't know what the actual base rate is, so we don't need to sort of assume certain hypothetical base rates that are excessively pessimistic based on observed experience. As a recent economic analysis of post-9-11 security spending in the U.S. demonstrates, the resources deployed to prevent another terrorist attack would only have been cost-justified if one assumed that enhanced homeland security measures deterred, prevented, protected against, or foiled four terrorist attacks a day, each causing 12 deaths and $100 million of property damage. In other words, assuming that every single day, right, since 9-11, we have 48 people dying, from terrorist attacks and $400 million of property damage. Right? If one uses the 77 London subway bombings as one's base case, 30 such attacks would have to take place annually to justify the increased security related expenditures. Even assuming a repeat of the 9 11 attack, right, it would have to occur at a rate of greater than once a year before the amount of increased homeland security spending by the United States would have been cost justified. The U.S. government's excessive and unreasonable spending from the perspective of any kind of rational expectations model on precaution against terrorism, however, does have the effect of creating the perception that the threat of terrorism, particularly, particularly terrorism in the name of Islam, is persuasive. The average citizen will think to himself, well, if the United States government is spending over $100 billion a year trying to prevent terrorism, it must really be a serious threat. Right. Okay, so the availability heuristic combined with government, with government policies, right, sharply skews public perception of the risks posed by terrorism in the name of Islam. Right? It, and, and so in light of this, it's not surprising at all that the majority of citizens might become fearful and might even agitate to limit the rights of Muslims. <coughs> Accordingly, whether we are speaking of Islam as a threat to a just democratic regime or saying that Muslims represent a special threat to public safety, in each case, the argument seems to proceed on, unsubstantiated, on the basis of unsubstantiated bias rather than objective evidence. Now, irrational thinking of the kind displayed by anti-Muslim forces, however, does not injure Muslims alone. While Muslims may be bearing the brunt of this irrationality, irrationality, once indulged in, in one area of the body politic, displays the properties of mercury. It is fast-moving, slippery, and exceedingly difficult to recover and dispose of. So today, in the United States, after 11 years of an unabated and unabating war on terror, the Republican Party, um, you know, I beg my, I beg forgiveness of any Republicans here, Bernie, 
has the Quote Party fully committed to irrationality in all aspects of policymaking, not just the war on terror? I say this as somebody, as somebody who was recently, since 1996, had voted for a Republican candidate for president. The Democratic Party, in turn, just as it has shown itself too cowardly to stand up to Republican irrationality in the context of terrorism, is also too cowed to stand up to Republican irrationality when it comes to economic policy. In short, because we have nonchalantly allowed bias to dominate our thinking with respect to terrorism, we have found it impossible to resist the force of bias in other policy areas as well. But with respect to the particular problem of Islamic democracy or Muslims and terrorism, I fear that our policies will produce results that are precisely the contrary to that which is intended. Far from convincing Muslims that Islamic democracy are compatible, or that terrorism is immoral and not Islamic, I believe that the results of treating the Muslim community as exceptional and not worthy of the same liberal protections guaranteed non-Muslims is that the Muslim community will become more and more alienated from their fellow citizens. An alienated group of citizens is much more likely to produce individuals willing to engage in politically motivated violence than one that is not. These tactics, therefore, are not only wrong-headed and immoral from the perspective of <laughs> political morality, but they are also counterproductive from a practical perspective, as it will inevitably have the effect of creating a larger pool of individuals ready to engage in politically motivated violence. This is doubly so in the case of American Muslims who grew up in the United States, because the American political culture itself extols the legitimacy of armed insurrection against tyranny. After all, we, we are a revolutionary republic. We are not a royalist republic like our neighbors to the north where I now live. The United States came to existence through armed insurrection and rebellion that is, um, that is uh, sanctified almost in our public political culture. It should not be surprising at all that the recently convicted Tariq Mahana and his sentencing statement explicitly referenced his education in American schools mm. as reinforcing a notion of the nobility of armed self-defense. When American Muslims are educated into the revolutionary values of American democracy, and then perceive that they are unjustly excluded from their rights as citizens, there is enhanced risk of alienation that actual terrorists can then exploit. A liberal perspective on the war on terrorism then would suggest that it be conducted from the government side with heightened respect for rights of communities that would otherwise be at risk. And far from using highly paid informants to flush out possible terrorists, through manipulation of religious sentiment, the government would restrict its policing activities to individuals who have manifested tangible steps toward accomplishing an act of violence and encourage the community in all sorts of ways to prevent people from becoming radicalized rather than going out and seeking and inducing their members to become radicalized. The government would also insist on pursuing security measures that are reasonably related to an objective assessment of the risk actually posed by terrorism using neutral means that distribute the burdens of security evenly throughout society. The requirement of neutral means, in fact, is the best practical check we have to ensure that the government does not target unfairly subsectors of society. For that reason, I have no criticism of government security measures at airports. Their very generality assures me that they are likely to have been adopted pursuant to a reasonably fair procedure. Monitoring programs of Muslim college students, however, and restaurants that Muslims frequent like the New York Police Department's recently exposed program, precisely because they are being targeted, are at the opposite end of the legitimacy spectrum. Here, there was no individualized uh, evidence of suspicion, and the targets of surveillance were chosen purely based on statistically irrelevant observations. For example, other suspected terrorists had, a, had attended events sponsored by the Muslim Students Association. That is one of the justifications that the NYPD has given, right? But that is simply an appeal to the availability heuristic that I suggested, which is a cognitive bias, not a basis for real um, uh, statistically relevant inference. Such a bias is understandable, but it is not excusable. It is the duty of government not only to protect us from, quote, those who wish to, to harm us, unquote, but it is also obliged to do so in a manner that is consistent with the good of all citizens, not just the majority. This requires that the government strive as much as possible to engage in bias for decision making. That, in fact, is one of the virtues uh, that the Founding Fathers identified in having a representative democracy rather than a direct democracy. 
James Madison wrote in the Federalist Papers that he believed that representative democracy was much more likely to produce less biased decision-making than direct democracy, which he believed had the tendency to empower factions motivated by self-interest, passion, and bias. But liberalism does not only place demands on the government. It also places demands on citizens. And in the time that remains, I wish to speak a little bit about what it, what it demands it imposes on Muslim citizens generally, and in the context of the war of terrorism in particular. In the first part of this lecture, I simply assumed that Muslims were an intolerant sect, to use Rawls's language, simply for the purpose of demonstrating that even on the basis of that assumption, policies adopted by liberal democracies that target the Muslim community are not justified. In this part of the paper, however, I relax that assumption and instead assume, more realistically, that there are elements within the Muslim community that are both tolerant and intolerant in the liberal sense. In fact, some individuals may be tolerant with respect to certain issues, for example, religious toleration, but intolerant with respect to other issues, for example, sexual orientation or gender equality. The issue I want to discuss is whether we should be concerned about this from an Islamic perspective. I do not want to engage in a diatribe that pits good Muslims against bad Muslims, because as the first part of my lecture made clear, I don't think the distinction really matters from a liberal perspective. Both good and bad Muslims are entitled to enjoy their rights as citizens of the United States. What I'm more interested in exploring is what democratic citizenship should mean from the internal perspective of normal of normative Islam, and how Muslims living in a liberal democracy should understand, should understand their religious convictions in light of their political commitments as citizens. Muslims, in my opinion, still have too much of a tendency to view themselves as an invalid minority, a posture that weakens the case for civic trusts, for civic trust, and reinforces a view of politics which is focused on, for lack of a better term, what's in it for me. To be fair, American Muslims can hardly be accused of being responsible for an American political culture that has come to be dominated by narrowly defined special interest groups, which attempt to manipulate the political process to extract the greatest benefits for themselves. But I believe that Muslims have a religious obligation to resist that temptation. Islam has many teachings that praise politically virtuous behavior and condemns political vices. Thus, in a widely reported statement of the Prophet Muhammad, he condemns anyone who has been appointed to a public office that abuses his position for private gain rather than pursuing the public good, or uses his, his public position to benefit his, his, his friends, for example, by appointing them to lucrative positions rather than appointing the most competent. Prophet Muhammad also reported, uh, was reported to have stated that religion is, is sincerity, deen al nasiha meaning that one, when one is consulted about anything, one must offer advice based on what one reasonably determines would be in the best interest of the person soliciting advice. Democratic rule, accordingly, is a political relationship in which individual members of the public deliberate collectively in furtherance of their common good, which we call the public good. It requires them to communicate honestly their sincere opinions regarding where the public good lies, not to use democratic deliberation, deliberation as a pretext to achieve their own private ends. This conception of deliberation is completely consistent with the centrality of nasiha, sincerity, uh, in Islamic political ethics. Indeed, this has led one modern Muslim jurist to identify voting as a kind of testimonial act, a shahada. He describes voting as a procedure whereby citizens are called on to express their view regarding which of the various candidates are the most trustworthy to be entrusted with the public good. That, it's, that, that voting is not an occasion when people get to pursue their own private interests and trying to capture the state and enlist the state to pursue those private ends. Right? So it's a very moral conception of what voting is about rather than a very instrumental one. The Islamic commitment to the pursuit of public good, in turn, requires or should require Muslims to adapt or develop a system of religious education that is consistent with the democratic values of mutual cooperation with equals in pursuit of the common good. This does not mean that Muslims must abandon their religious conceptions of proper or improper behavior, but it does require that Muslims' moral rejection of other lifestyles not lead them to break bonds of civic friendship. In other words, religious education needs to stress the difference between religious fraternity and civic fraternity. 
and that one need not come at the expense of the other. And where there appears to be a conflict, a Muslim must strive to reconcile the requirements of religious fraternity with civic fraternity. This is a long-term project, but ultimately requires a reorientation of the goal of religious education from one focused on identity retention, which is often uh, the driver, particularly behind immigrant institutions, to one focused on theological and moral and ethical instruction. But the duties of liberal citizenship also have a particular significance in the context of the war on terror. American Muslims, understandably, have attempted to withdraw as much as possible from public debate on issues related to the war on terrorism, its conduct, and how it might be concluded, if ever. Where they have not withdrawn, they have been effectively excluded. To the extent that they comment on the war on terrorism at all, they are rarely critical, and they are content generally to engage in ritualistic denunciations of al-Qaeda and terrorism. The inability to formulate a critical discourse in opposition to the central narrative of the war on terrorism, they hate us for our freedoms, has been a glaring weakness of the American Muslim community in the years since 9-11. Very few Muslims would agree, at least in private, that al-Qaeda chose to withdraw the United States because it, quote unquote, hated American freedoms, rather than American policy. But painfully few are willing to challenge this rationale publicly. Yet, failure to do so is, in a profound way, a breach of the duties of citizenship. Democracy only works when citizens freely express their views. And when Muslims exercise self-censorship, they violate these duties in two respects. First, they fail to take seriously their obligation to contribute to the public good. In other words, they do not live up to the ideal of al-Siha, that Islam, as well as democratic citizenship, imposes on them. And they express implicit distrust of non-Muslim citizens, whom they believe will react irrationally to Muslim criticisms of US policy. While Islamophobia is real, and I do not wish to downplay the existence of organized forces who genuinely hate Islam and Muslims, and who genuinely hope, and who hope to one day to have even the most modest public manifestations of Islam criminalized, we should not exaggerate the strength of the bigots. In the years since 9-11, some attempts to build or expand mosques, for example, have been the subject of successful opposition. But scores more have been built without engendering massive protests or anti-Muslim backlash. Just as the majority is not entitled to assume uh, that an intolerant minority is incapable of appreciating the virtues of democracy, so too, a minority is not entitled to assume that the majority will turn a deaf ear to their well-grounded arguments. In other words, Muslims are rightly concerned that their citizenship rights have been substantially eroded in the wake of 9-11. But at the same time, they're at least partially responsible for this erosion insofar as that they have refused, generally speaking, to exercise those rights, whether in public fora, in front of elected politicians, or even use courtrooms to assert their rights. Rights become strong when they are regularly exercised. When rarely used, they become flabby and incapable of performing when most needed. Accordingly, American Muslims need to get in the habit of exercising their rights without fear. The more they do so, the more effective the rights they have the, the, will be, the more effective the rights they have will be. This plea to American Muslims to exercise their rights is not just for the benefit of the Muslim community, or even for the American political community. It is also a legitimate national security concern. While the US government, unfortunately, believes that religion, particularly too much Islam, leads to radicalization and then a willingness to commit violence, I believe the causation is exactly the opposite. Political alienation is the first step, then followed by indoctrination into a worldview that justifies resistance to oppression. Islam is simply one widely available discourse of resistance that in, in our current circumstances happened to have gained some currency. It could very well have been communism 50 years ago that provided the ideological framework to engage in acts of insurrection. Although in US history, to be, to be fair, most cases of armed insurrection have been inspired by right wing politics, not the left. In any case, American Muslims, particularly young Muslim men, for the reasons I previously discussed, are vulnerable to alienation. And without a robust commitment to democratic politics on the part of the American Muslim community, some of these alienated young men might be tempted to engage in acts of violence. Accordingly, it is crucial that American Muslims, particularly American Muslim institutions, take on a more vocal and active political role, even if that means burning bridges in the short term with elected politicians. It is much better for the Muslim community to demonstrate a constructive and active response 
to what they perceive as being un unjust, and unjust rather than sink into passivity and alienation. Taking politically critical positions in public will not only reinforce Muslims standing as active citizens, it will also lessen the attractiveness of radical ideologues who will accuse community leaders based on their silence of cowardice and indifference to suffering of Muslims. These attacks have had the effect, in at least some cases, of undermining the legitimacy of American Muslim organizations. And based on my own experience as an expert witness in various terrorism cases, are a motivating factor for people who, uh, who have turned their backs on mainstream Muslim communities and sought out uh, more radical uh, organizations. More robust criticism of war and terrorism, in fact, then could deflect this line of criticism and in turn inoculate young men against the temptation of extremist politics. To conclude, liberal democracies, even before 9 11, were having a difficult time understanding how Islam and Muslims would fit within their polities. These problems became crises in the wake of 9 11, and the enhanced security measures adopted in the wake of those attacks and the result in the war on terror. As a result, Muslim communities living in the West are now the subjects of a security paradigm rather than a citizenship paradigm. Liberalism rejects this approach, not because it is powerless in defending as the intolerant, but because the actual circumstances of Islam and liberal and Muslims in liberal democracies, even if we were to accept as true the views of the most extreme anti-Muslim activists, do not make Muslims a reasonable threat, either to public safety or the institutions of a free democracy. If anything, it is the overreaction of the majority to the perceived threat of Islam and Muslims that is underlying democracy. Western democracies can only correct the direction of state by undertaking a careful and sober assessment of the risks that Muslims are set to pose to the stability of the constitutional order and to public safety without indulging biased assumptions rooted in irrational fear. At the same time, American Muslims and Muslim citizens of other democratic countries need to take their obligations of citizenship more seriously including the obligation to pursue the public good actively with their fellow citizens through, among other things, public deliberation. This means that Muslims should not be shy about expressing their opposition to various strategies using the war on terror, whether overseas or domestically. Ironically, if organized, sustained, and public opposition to post-9-11 anti-terrorism tactics might be the best strategy to counter the risk of radicalization, which, if there's no change in the direction of the numerous policies targeting Muslims, may only increase the 